Uh, my name is Mark Wetley. On behalf of the Department of Art, I want to welcome you to this evening's lecture by Sean Leonardo, entitled Embodied Performance. Before we begin, a word of thanks to lectures and concerts for their generous support of this event through the Blythe Bickle Edwards Fund. Thanks also to the Art History Program and the Bowdoin College Museum of Art for joining the Visual Arts Program and sponsoring this event. Finally, thanks also to Tony Sprague, Director of Events and Summer Programs, Megan Moros in Communications, Sean Burris, Joe Hulska, and Amanda Skinner of the Bowdoin College Museum of Art, Gina Edwards, the Visual Arts Department Coordinator, and Colleen Kinsella, our Visual Arts Technician, as well as our work study students for all they've done to coordinate and make this event possible. One of the greatest rewards for any professor is to see their former students excel in whatever their chosen field. And in this regard, watching the trajectory of Sean's career has been rewarding indeed. A few years ago, in one of our courses together, I had occasion to mention a discredited but appealing notion that I'd borrowed from developmental biology that states, ontology recapitulates phylogeny. This string of $10 words was shorthand for the idea that our development in the womb resembles the evolution of our species from single cell organisms to the present. In class that day, I was riffing on this idea to suggest that our individual artistic development from childhood to adulthood might resemble Western art history from the symbolic representation of cave art through the naturalism and idealism of the Greeks and the Renaissance to the abstraction and creative independence of modernism. This idea is also shaky, I'm aware of that, but it was more of a conversation starter and that's what it did. The words ontology recapitulates phylogeny were barely out of my mouth when I heard a familiar voice shout out, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> Accompanied by his infectious laugh, I didn't have to look over to know it was Sean, who still holds the record for the fastest call out of my teaching career. It's a story I recall fondly, but it's also characteristic of tonight's speaker. Sean has always been someone who is not afraid to question what doesn't make sense to him and to challenge all forms of obfuscation. This courageous intellectual habit is also manifested in the way his drawings and performances question social expectations and injustices, particularly those self-defeating narratives about who we are and what we are capable of that we are often labeled with rather than allowed to determine for ourselves. His seniors show a group of paintings that examined masculinities, especially black and brown masculinities, and drawn from his own experience, is one of the few that still resonate after all these years. I'm happy to report that one of these paintings has recently been added to the collection of the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. Sean's path after Bowdoin began in his native New York City, where he worked as a graphic designer. In 2003, he enrolled in the San Francisco Art Institute, along with his Bowdoin classmates, Jen Rabin and Peter Sheridan, where he received his MFA degree in painting in 2005. Midway through his degree, he also attended the prestigious Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture here in Maine, where many years later in 2019, he was named to their Board of Governors. On a similar note, Sean is currently on the board of the Socrates Sculpture Park in Long Island City, and we're also fortunate to have him as a member of the Bowdoin College of Art Advisory Council. Since receiving his MFA, Sean has presented a great many exhibitions and performances at some of the most highly regarded venues in the country, including the Guggenheim Museum of Art, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Mass MoCA, PS1, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Bronx Museum, the New Museum, and our own Portland Museum of Art, among many others. His work has been seen internationally at museums and other venues in Asia, Eastern and Western Europe, Canada, and Mexico. Not content with these notable benchmarks of art world achievement alone, one of Sean's most extraordinary and ongoing, ongoing accomplishments has been co-founding Assembly, a program that enables artists to work directly with young people who have gotten caught up in the criminal justice system. Through art, performance, and storytelling, it's a diversion program that enables them to achieve long-term, meaningful, creative involvement and employment in the arts. Having met some of them, I've been deeply moved by how their lives have been turned around through this experience. In addition to his work with Assembly, earlier this year, Sean became co-director of Recess, 
the parent organization that oversees the program. That project and others are amply documented online, and I urge you to search there for the profile of his work that appeared last summer in the New York Times, to watch The Freedom to Move, a recent documentary about his work on Art 21, or to see the video documentation for Primitive Games, his extraordinary performance at the Guggenheim Museum, among many others. Just two weeks ago, Sean presented his most recent public artwork, Between Four Freedoms, at the Franklin D. Roosevelt Four Freedom State Park on Roosevelt Island in New York City, which I think he might be telling us about tonight. On his way here from New York this past weekend, he stopped in Boston to appear on the Moth main stage, which I very much look forward to hearing when it eventually airs on the Moth Radio Hour. I mentioned earlier that one of a professor's greatest rewards is seeing their students excel. Another is the point when you realize with gratitude how much they have taught you in return. Won't you please join me in welcoming Sean Leonardo. Thanks, y'all, for coming out. You know, as is the nature of performance, I, I often feel like it's a disservice to my practice and therefore to you to talk about the work. And so instead, when I'm presented with this kind of opportunity, I try to show the work a little bit, at least as an entry point to everything that I'm about to display for you. But it's also the nature of my work to not perform for, but perform with. So this is going to require your participation. And I know it's Monday night. Y'all are not down for this. But I promise you it'll be gentle. <clears throat> and I also promise you it's like the exact starting point that we need for tonight. If you wouldn't mind just to shake off this room, with your permission, I'd like to ask you to stand up real quick. And what I would like for you to do is do something that's actually a rather simple exercise at first, or it may seem so anyway. I want you to imagine the word justice written across your mind's eye. Now, the challenge to this is that I'd like for you to also not associate any image with that word. So simply write that word across your mind's eye. For some of you, that might require you closing your eyes. For others, that might mean that you need to soften your gaze. But see that word and try to, for that word to be devoid of any meaning, any association. Try to not accompany that word with any visual imagery. Just see that word. How is that written across your mind? What fonts appeared? Is it bold, italics? Is it all caps? Quite literally, see that word written across your mind. And now for some of you, that might be black text on a white background. And for others, that might be white text on a black background. Just see the word. And now in a moment, I'm going to invite you to replace that word with an image. Don't go there yet. I'm going to count down from three. And what I'd like for you to do is offer me an image that best communicates that word. Now, I want you to try a little harder here, but don't overthink it. Don't go there yet. Just see the word. But when you offer me an image, I'd like that for that to be in a silent, frozen gesture, a pose. And I'd like for that word to be communicated in a way that makes sense to you and only you. So if the result is something entirely abstract, don't worry about it. 
Allow that word to flow through your body and your lived experience and offer me the image of that word in a silent, frozen gesture. Don't overthink it. In three, two, one, go ahead. And freeze, please. There's a really bright light that prevents me from seeing you. Okay. Hold it, please. And now, without moving too much, try to take in what other people around you have offered. Okay. Now, there are a few similarities. And if you get tired, I understand. Try to go back into the gesture as best as possible. And now I see quite a bit of, may I ask you in the sweatshirt, what's happening for you? What's going through your mind? Mm -hmm. What's occurring to you? Why did you, wh what occurred to you in producing the gesture? Balance. Okay. May I ask you? Giving and also receiving. So an exchange of some sorts right behind. May I ask you? A posture of strength. Okay. Here. I love that. There are a lot of parallels happening in this room. Now slightly different. An up downturned hand. Okay. Okay. Connection. And now here. Yep. Also strength, but an articulation right here. And then here. You, yeah. Understanding. Okay. Beautiful. And finally, in the blue and right? Mm -hmm. No, let's get both of you, yeah. Giving, receiving, and here. And someone who is about to speak up? Okay. <laughs> and yeah, and I'm going to ask you. Okay, the giving from our place, no, our heart place. So. Um, Unfreeze. Go ahead and sit down, please. Now, what's interesting is that the language that so many of you use sounds very similar. And yet there were quite important variations of the gestures that you all offered in articulating very similar things. Whether it was a pose of strength that required this posture of outward expression versus something that was actually much more gentle and closer to the body. And yet both of you use the word strength. There was this notion of exchange, of gift and rece of reception that required some individuals to extend outward or closer to the body or simply just here. And so how can we start to understand that in our use of language, we hear very similar things, and yet through our bodies, we start to see differences appear. What if I told you that in other communities, and I would consider this a community, certainly there is an allegiance to a place. There is an assignment of membership to this school in various ways. But what if I told you in a different context and in a different place, certainly a different setting, what I've received was something more deliberately like this, or this, 
or maybe more explicitly this or this. All articulations of the same word, justice, and now present here are very kind and generous folks, and so it doesn't surprise me that we move into a space of understanding justice as something that is exchanged. But what if you're, in your lived experience, justice was something constantly being applied as oppression? What if that same word in your lived experience was something that was equated with silencing? What if in your body that same word flowed through your experience and therefore your articulation of that word felt something closer to vengeance, retribution, violence, same word. Same word that we often take for granted in its definitions, and yet when it flows through e our bodies, even in a single community, what is expressed outwardly looks different. And then across a community looks very different. So much of my work stems from this failure of language, especially in regards to systems and the ways in which we take something like justice for granted, justice as implemented, enforced, given. And so the argument in, at the center of so much of my practice is that words can't possibly articulate certain experiences certain experiences that are housed in the body as trauma. And that by extension, that same word can often lead to difference across communities, across individuals, if not studied more carefully. And so sometimes in order to get to the essence of a word, we have to remove language entirely and see how that exists within our body and therefore express through body language unveiling a very different kind of truth. I'm going to play a video that I think really expands on what I'm talking about. I warn you that there are moments that are a little difficult. This video, which utilizes the methodology that I'm sort of describing, was actually uh, the result of a series of workshops that were conducted over the pandemic and which started in person and therefore moved to a virtual space. It was a work in which I hoped to move into a live performance and then took on a very different form. It was also a work in which I intentionally tried to bring together four distinct communities, all with a unique relationship to justice, specifically within the Rikers Island complex. Rikers Island being the most, one of the most notorious prison complexes, specifically in New York City, but in the, across the country and in the world. The four communities memberships, affiliations being court-involved youth, meaning youth with open court cases, formerly incarcerated individuals, corrections officers and workers, and legal advocates both in the defense and prosecution spaces. I would say by default there was a fifth membership that, cr crossed, that crossed all four of those previous four and that being survivors of crime.
And so what I want to do now is fix the memory as you all in your minds to tell yourself that story. Go back to that place that you felt most alone. And really focus in on what your body was doing. We're doing the movie language and see what happens in that moment of loneliness. Again, what was your body doing? And that same narrative is conveyed through the body. A countdown from three. See what kind of truth is passed through our gesture. In three, two, one. Yeah. Who would you like to go first? Um, I'll go first this time. One of my memories that I always think about was like somebody pulling me on the other side of that wall, pulling me over those gates, and then just letting me walk back home to my mom's house, and then hugging her. You know what I mean? So let me just ask you, let's withhold the stories real quick and just go into the, the body language. All right. Uh, you go first. I'm gonna just show you. Can you see me? Yeah. There's something else there that pulls you in. It gives you like a sense of uh, not belonging, but a sense of I've been there before. I know what you're feeling right now. And that's a very human thing. That's the part of the story that gets lost. Yeah. You know, we start to project we start to see our own stories in the other person's gesture. The body tells a story. That story is truer than the words that we might share. Because our bodies don't lie in the same way. You can't fake it. Yeah. Our bodies, our psyches carry all of these experiences and they have a way of informing everything that we do. Because how could we not think about a person like yourself that is having to deal with both at the same time? Yeah. It's just, it's hard to think, you know what I mean? Like, the only thing you're trying to do is think, and you just, you're just blank to it. It's like a real dim yellow light in ourselves, and you're just stuck. Our windows have bars and razor wire on the top of them. You're just thinking like you got lost a little bit into your mind. Mm hmm Honestly, the dangers, it still hasn't even hit me that much. I was thinking more about like not getting out early, having to be stuck in, in this shithole with all these stupid ass COVID rules. They're trying to keep us separate in a place where, you, where all you have is people. They took our visits, all our contact with everybody. They weren't letting us do nothing. So we were just lost. I was just staring at my window debating life, you know what I mean? Now you're on the other side of that window. Yeah. You know, this is what you're saying to me. It's like, you know, there's a lot trying to welcome me on the other side. It's going to be messy. It's going to get ugly at times. There's something still at the core of the story. So I was debating and I was thinking like, should I get out do good or should I keep doing what I'm doing? You know what I mean? Should I try to change my life back to cycle or should I keep going? 
And then I always thought in my mind, like, why should it be me? Then I realized we're all going to have that mentality, you feel? So might as well just be the one to do it. Now, when we first convened in person in the workshop space, and even when we rearranged ourselves and, and started to meet in the virtual space, the question, the starting point was a difficult one, but actually rather simple. Was there some commonality situated in between these four distinct communities, all with a unique relationship to Rikers in particular, but justice more broadly? Is there something that could be found between these groups, groups that would otherwise prefer to identify one another as other or worse, as enemy? Could there be some type of articulation beyond words, but through the body, some passing of truth that actually created a familiarity, a common ground between, between these individuals that had such painful experiences between them? And then as we started to gather and as we started to move through this difficult territory, so much of the conversation took a turn because we were existing in COVID. And so our experiences, their experiences of isolation, desperation, struggle within the confinement of prison, whether you were a legal practitioner, a corrections officer, a formerly incarcerated person, or a young person with prison hovering over your head, that articulation of fear looked very similar in people's bodies. But the pivot with COVID forced us to look at what it might mean, what it might feel like in desperation, struggle, isolation, to be in prison with the dangers of the coronavirus and the ways in which that experience all of a sudden is amplified in its desperation, in its struggle, in its isolation. And so we started to consider what that danger looked like what it might feel like. And that brought this work to the young man that you were listening to, Carlos, who at the time was spending a few years in juvenile detention, starting at the age of 15. And the work and the commitment of every other individual in that space pivoted to really be dedicated to thinking about Carlos and his experience and really creating a very different type of discussion to examine the injustices of juvenile detention and the ways that during COVID, a young man like Carlos couldn't even see his family, he couldn't even pick up the phone, and how so much of that anxiety must have escalated in his body, must have felt so much more dire. Now, I'm both happy and relieved to say that I was working with Carlos while he was incarcerated. And during either the second or third workshop with him, I called in um, and the supervisor corrections officer uh, you know, this is this goes to show you like the, the lack of organization within the systems. Like went to go look for him and then had realized that he actually been released. Um, and so my final workshop with Carlos actually connected with him in his home. And the entire work funneled into thinking about, more specifically thinking about what freedom might be for him and for other young people locked up, especially during COVID. But it was in that video and in working with these individuals that I really started focusing in on particularly what the hands were doing. And so you saw a lot happening there, right? And I became more and more focused on 
the slippage of information that was occurring specifically in the gestures of hands. And how so often when someone is speaking, what they're doing with their hands betrays what's leaving their mouth. And so I started gravitating toward the possibilities of hand gestures. But before I go there, I'm going to back up and talk a little bit about how I arrived at both this methodology, but also this belief around what I call embodied performance, which is exactly precisely what I've been talking about, in which, you know, I believe and therefore make the argument in, in my work that there are certain events, certain experiences and narratives that cannot possibly be given verbal telling. That instead we have to develop an attunement to what our bodies are saying. And it was in these earlier works that I started really honing in on this methodology and thinking about the possibilities of engagement. In this piece entitled, I Can't Breathe After the Killing of Eric Garner in Staten Island, I created a participatory piece staged as a self-defense course. And audience members uh, submitted themselves willingly to being participants in what they thought was a workshop. And over the course of about 30 to 45 minutes, I shared very real techniques of how to escape certain holds, how to protect oneself, how to defend oneself, culminating in the maneuver, which the NYPD still to this day refuses to call a chokehold, the same chokehold that took the life of Eric Garner. Now, the contradiction of that culminating piece as it moved into something that looked more like a performance is that in order to in order to combat the chokehold one has to go on the offensive and now i refuse to teach offensive maneuvers in that space one but two what was important in the work, especially as individuals were paired with strangers, feeling how these maneuvers, how they felt on their bodies and the sensations that went through their bodies as they were enacting these aggressive maneuvers on a stranger, what was most important is in, is in its final moments, the realization that for certain bodies, Self-defense is a lose-lose. That for certain individuals in the face of power, and particularly the authority of something like the police department, the moment that you try to defend oneself, you're bringing more danger onto your body. And in the case of Eric Garner, death. And as people moved and particularly practiced the chokehold itself and attempted to relieve the pressure of that maneuver, you would feel the sensation of that weight bearing down on your chest, around your neck, tightening around your head. And there was no way after that sensation, after that experience, that the tragedy of Eric Garner's death killing would exist as a headline for you moving forward. That information that you would try to rationalize, even justify, moved from that intellectual thought and bared itself down and lodged itself somewhere else in your body. And that is much more difficult to walk away from. All of a sudden, we become accountable to that life, to that name, to this history, this history of violence. This is a piece called Eulogy, which traveled for the, about four years and culminated in the High Line, which took the form of a New Orleans jazz funeral procession, where I invited audience members to a funeral, to a collective mourning for individuals that had been killed by the police. The speech itself, the eulogy, was taken from the middle of Ralph Ellison's The Invisible Man, a book that had has been influential to nearly everything I've ever done. And it's in that speech that the nameless 
narrator is attempting to commemorate a man that was really forgotten, lost. A st- and he often says the term forgotten to history, becoming a statistic. And so every time the narrator said, Brother Todd Clifton, the person that he was attempting, struggling to memorialize, I replaced that name with the name of a person of color, particularly a young man of color that had been killed. And it started with, you know, a scope of about four years. And the scope just get, kept getting smaller and smaller because so many names kept getting added to the fucking list. And I found it a powerful experience to invite strangers to mourn with one another. To mourn a life that they've only seen in the newspapers. And just to simply see what that might look like, feel like. As you stood next to someone who you don't know, but are there to remember and to see, feel your place in this, in this space. And so much of this work has evolved into thinking about how it might be placed between communities, particularly communities in conflict, similarly to the video that we started with. And so this is the Guggenheim Project entitled Primitive Games, in which I worked with four distinct communities separately this time, all with unique relationship to guns military veterans, the New York Police Department, a group that I coined Citizens Impacted by Street Violence, and a final group of firearm users. That's what they call them, gun enthusiasts, you might describe. And then in this final gladiatorial event, invited them to debate one another about gun violence, but without the use of words. And it was in that moment where so much of that alliance, of that membership that those individuals held on on to so firmly and throughout their lives, those memberships that secure and validate their worldviews, how those allegiances started to slip away because they had to grapple with, they had to contend, they had to reckon with a person that was in front of them. Not some stand-in for enemy, or some stand-in for some political divide. I promised Mark I would talk about some two-dimensional stuff. (laughs) And I often do like to weave both the studio practice and performance practice in together because they do inform each other in ways that I'm not even knowledgeable of, that I'm not even totally cognizant of. And the next three drawings were from a recent series, specifically on the subject of police violence. But this, these last three drawings were of particular importance to me in my own personal biography, because unlike the other tragedies that we were seeing in the news, this was an individual, Frederico Pereira, that I grew up with and for which there was no visual evidence of his killing by the NYPD. And it had been something clearly I had buried. He was killed somewhere around my 12, you know, when I was 12 or 13 years old, right outside my apartment building. He was my neighbor. He lived upstairs. Good looking guy. Someone that you envied, you know. I can remember him having this crazy big boa, go boa constrictor, and him riding the elevator with this thing. And, you know, in, 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 es- the, in the sort of process of excavation that is so important to my work, what starts to happen is that it, things start call- being, being called up for me, things that I had not remembered. And so I went to the archives and, of course, without fail, so much of the information was there in news reports. And this had been called the Rodney King case of Queens. But because there was no visual evidence, I had to rely upon the medical examiner's report. And what was described to me might as well have been George Floyd. Identical to what I witnessed in that execution. And so 
I decided for myself to source imagery that explain to me what might have happened to Freddie given the information that I've gained. And that led me to these drawings, which are rather large, all charcoal, but in the space of the victim, there is a mirrored tint where you as the viewer are forced to see yourself and implicate yourself in the image, whether it's an identification with victim or perpetrator. In this case, that being a cut. But again, you know, the way things sort of swirl and move around, I start becoming real fascinated with what the hands were telling me. So in this detail, and of, uh, forgive the reflection, you can see where the mirror tint is. That's where I'm standing, and that's where sort of, you know, the mirror tint is um, showing you what's, behind, what's in front of this drawing. But the way that this hand is embracing the invisible victim's wrist and then the pressure of this hand. And this one here. How so much might get lost in the drama and commotion of an image like this. But when you slow down and focus on something like that hand, you see exactly where the lack of humanity in this scene is. And so in the studio, I started really fixating my attention on hands. And of course, with the pandemic, I started also contemplating mourning and the lack of collective mourning that we've been uh, permitted the greatest injustice of the last two years is the way in which individuals have had to die alone. And so I started to think about those individuals that we should have paid more attention to while they were alive. And I started to think about more specifically outside of their craft, what could have been found in just the gestures of their hands, what they tried to message to us, the weight and importance and wisdom that they attempted to convey to the world if we just paid closer attention. And some of us did. These are on plywood cutouts, about four feet by four feet. And so what you're seeing as the white is the wall. These are painted with sign enamel and pearlescent powder, pearlescent pigment. So they actually have somewhat of a goldish sheen underneath the paint. And they're mounted directly onto the wall. And these are being made right now. So I haven't shown anybody these, by the way. You're very, you know. Uh, Tony Morrison. Tupac Shakur. James Baldwin, Eric Garner, and finally, someone that was very close to me as a mentor and who has a connection to this place, this place being Bowdoin, and more largely Maine, Dr. David Driscoll. And in creating these what I would consider portraits, I tried to look for these moments, these gestures that really captured the essence of these individuals, but also occurred or it would be the thing that they did when they were trying to share with us, particularly in the, in the telling of something. So this be David, Dr. Driscoll, I can f remember him doing this all the time when he's dropping some gems, you know. Or this moment where Eric Garner, we always think about the I can't breathe moment. 
where he's saying that, reciting that 11 times as he's dying underneath the weight of those officers. But it's in this moment that we often forget where he says, I'm not taking this anymore. Where he was telling us this is, wasn't a one-time incident that he felt persecuted on his own block. Something like, no, not again. I'm not taking this anymore. Y'all keep harassing me. He was telling us something. And then finally, I want to leave you with my current project that just opened two weeks ago at Four Freedoms Park on Roosevelt Island, which is situated between Queens and Manhattan on the East River. These murals, which are made out of vinyl and, and applied to Louis Kahn's memorial to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but more specifically, his speech for freedoms, which was a pivotal speech in encouraging, convincing the United States Congress to enter World War II. And it's during this speech that he articulates the basic human need around four freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. The interesting th thing to me as I approached this memorial is that in the original speech, what was being shared in the context of World War II was the desire, need, the righteousness, <sighs> impulse to secure democracy globally. And stating that world, worldwide, these were the essential, the basic human things that need to be secured. And yet, however many years later, those same things are not bestowed among the United States' own citizens freedom from want, freedom from fear, freedom of speech and expression, and freedom of worship. And so as an intervention, I decided to see what some of the most vulnerable community members of at least New York City would say about those four freedoms. And so in a series of workshops, what we decided to do in the nature of the methodology that I, I was describing to you is not not share particular stories, but instead see how experiences related to those four freedoms would be conveyed through the body with a special focus on these folks' hands and what they did with their hands. And it's my belief that in calling that history forward to see how they have been actively, the four freedoms that is, actively withheld, barred, or stripped away from our own very citizens. We can get more closely, not only to the contradictions of that, of that speech and the content within, but also the aspirations toward freedom. The hope and struggle of these individuals as they seek out liberation. And so those workshops generated the gestures that you see here. Again, in vinyl, applied to the surface, and I'm not gonna get this exactly right, but this is somewhere around 30 feet in height. And I'll show you a few views. That's being the other side of the park facing Queens. And then the unique opportunity and challenge was to offer visitors more depth, more insight as to, as to what generated these gestures. And so for the first time, I started to think about what a translation of my performance practice might be in physical space. And so not only this result, but 
using Google image recognition technology, whether you're on site or across the river, you can actually activate these gestures into animations on your phones, offering a window into the workshop process and the lives and musings of these participants as they talk about freedom. And so I'm going to share with you two of the animations and voiceovers. And I think, okay, in saying the freedom from what, you must mean a freedom from wanting these basic things, a freedom from feeling empty, a feeling from feeling alone, a freedom from struggling financially, a freedom from just knowing you'll be able to eat tonight. It doesn't have to be in the morning. It doesn't have to be the day, but at least I'll get to eat tonight. At least I'll get to sleep. These are things so many of us don't get. It was a look of shock. And my hands to the front was actually because I was handcuffed. And at the age of 16, I was sentenced to three to nine years in state prison. And But the whole time I was being told by a public defender, don't worry, you're going to get probation. Don't worry. And I was actually arrested at 15, but I was sentenced when I was 16 to three to nine years. And I didn't hear nothing but the nine years. So I, I didn't know what that was or what it was going to be like, or I was just shocked. You know, alongside justice, the word freedom is a really curious word. When we think about freedom, and if you're a student that I visited earlier this morning, I tried to create a distinction for you between freedom and liberation. And what's so beautiful about getting closer to these participants is that similarly to justice, freedom was understood as something that was enacted outside of them. Whether they were formerly incarcerated or someone who had experienced homelessness or someone that could not obtain citizenship, citizenship status or someone that had a disability or didn't, or didn't live in a context that embraced gender fluidity. These were all individuals who understood that freedom at, at any given moment could be stripped away or never offered. And yet, they were able to, in the ways that they walked through the world, understand that while freedom is something that is systemically and therefore systematically enacted and, and possibly removed, that in their everyday they could still seek out joy, that they could still be in their power, and that they could still find and strive toward liberation against all odds. And as I said, when the peace opened, I would love to see a world that starts to put those stories and lives on a pedestal and really start to think about how maybe monuments, as we understand them, don't serve us anymore. And that maybe alongside FDR and that incredibly powerful speech, we might look at a life, a person, a leader that would, we, that would otherwise be overlooked because those individuals that fight for freedom, fight to, to have liberation and joy in their lives, those are the folks we need to celebrate. That's it.
they take questions. I think, how do you want to do this, Mark? What would make you ask a question? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, a very logistical question. Mm. When you talk about workshops, how do you find the people who are joining your workshops? Yeah, great question. I mean, I th um, re recruitment looks very different for every project. Um, I should say that much of my work is situated in the assembly program, which Mark described, which I co-founded now seven years ago. And when that program first started, it, wor it worked in cooperation with the court system. And so youth were mandated to, to join us in order to have their cases uh, closed and their records sealed. We since have evolved into a program that receives youth by referral as well. We still work in tandem with the courts and uh, even more so have expanded to direct um, call it negotiation with the district attorney's office and have also in recent years uh, incurred into the felony space, so much graver um, sentences. Now for projects outside of the assembly space, you know, it, it, it differs. For the Guggenheim project, there was one person in each, in each one of those communities that I had a trusting relationship and, and whom I could call on to assist in recruitment. And it's just a testament to how I move through life that I actually have relationships with military veterans, NYPD, gangsters, and guys that are you know, wielding weapons and shooting ranges and hunting. Uh, I somehow find myself in the middle of these communities and you know, I, I should say, as I said earlier to the class that joined me, so much of my work starts from a personal question, a place of discomfort. And when I was looking at the tragedy of gun violence in our country and how it was being debated, and I'm going to use that word in the political sphere, one of the questions that emerged for me is like, how is it that I could possibly have relationships in all four of these corners that are so ve vehemently opposed to one another. And I felt the responsibility to do something with that. And that brought me to the project. It brought me to negotiating and uh, recruitment in each one of those groups. Now, as I move through outside communities, meaning communities that are not my own, communities that I don't touch when I travel the country, often I rely upon a collaboration or a collaborator and um, to at least create the opening for relationship building, the relationships being um, most important. And so it's not the type of work that you can rush. And that's what many institutions don't understand. They're like, they want the, they want the big thing. They're like, mm, I need a few years to even be someone that these people will come to, that, these pe that, 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 I will, that will join me in an inquiry. And when I am in conversation, when I am building relationships with, the, with, with participants, I always say the same thing. I can't tell you what the outcome is going to be. And I want you to commit to a process and not an outcome. And you'd be surprised how many people are curious enough to go along that ride with you. Any questions? You good? <laughs> I just love that. Thank you. Oh, it's fine. I think that one's cool. Yeah. Sean, thank you so much for a really powerful presentation. Um, I was very interested in your comments about memorials at the end of your uh, at the end of your talk, and I really look forward to seeing um, the piece at Four Freedoms Park. Um, but what I'm curious about is 
uh, the way in which um, your intervention on the FDR memorial um, transforms our understanding of an existing monument, mm -hmm. um, transforms our understanding of an existing architecture, and of course, all sorts of ideas are carried along in architecture. And I was interested about um, an approach to memorials that transforms a history that, that perhaps um, uh, predates us. And then whether you are also thinking about the development of other sorts of structures um, that might have their own um, permanence or perhaps impermanence um, mm -hmm. in our built environment. So I just mm -hmm. wondered if you could speak a little bit um, about the dynamic of transforming what already exists yeah. and the construction potentially of new forms of um, space or architecture um, as a form of memorial. Yeah, I love Th that. Thank I you. I love that. Um, and I will say that this that was my very first public art commission and therefore has opened an entirely new possibility in my practice. And so I welcome the opportunity to create something from a non-existent uh, structure and context, even though that's impossible. That context is always pre-existing. What I would say in connection to your question is, and I think you're alluding to it, the very disappointment of public monument as we know them is its permanence is the way that it attempts to fix history. And oftentimes is a history that celebrates the winner and the ways that the winner wants to be seen. And in some cases, the way the loser wants to be celebrated as winner. If you think about monuments in the South and the distortion of history and the very disappointment of these public monuments, which are typically in the form of sculptures, is that they are only, they stay the same and, are, and therefore don't evolve with an analysis of history. And so what was really important to me in this piece was two things. One, that in investigating the substance of this speech that I brought participants in to breathe new life to how we look at the four freedoms, not as a re-articulation of the speech as we understood it, but instead a new interpretation or reinterpretation of what those four same four freedoms means to us today. And that to me is the great possibility of public art and therefore artistic event interventions is to say that history is never done. And alongside that, therefore, it was really uninteresting to me to think about a work that would be a counter narrative or um, sort of an in, uh, uh, something that would antagonize FDR. Because that to me felt really limiting. And sure, I think there is a place and time to recontextualize, reanalyze, problematize our heroes, our, the canon, how we understand uh, history as told through a particular lens. But I'm much more compelled to think about instead of situating an intervention in the past, to think about meaning in the present, if that makes sense. Hopefully that makes sense. I can go on and on with this subject. <laughs> but I do think that there's some beautiful possibilities. And with the animation, with the technology, to hear the voices and to experience movement disrupts that the static nature of, of an otherwise permanent thing. And I think there, there's going to be some really beautiful options there. As a young artist, I think I struggle with when I finish art, I let it into the viewer's eye. And after that, like it's up to them to decide. 
I'm wondering, like, as an established artist, do you feel that, like, you struggle with this relinquishing control to the viewer and that, like, perhaps in letting them interpret it, they will never fully understand truly what you're trying to convey? And how do you deal with that almost, especially with such powerful works that you put out? Those are great questions. I'm going to offer you two answers that will contradict each other. <laughs> um, part of me says, I'm not really going to shit. And I think as you hone in your, your, on your craft, what has to be absolutely important is that, yes, while the viewer brings their own subjectivity and therefore filter to their looking and to their experience, that your interpretation, your own intentionality, damn well better be there. And it's in the craft itself that that becomes possible, that you point in toward a direction, toward meaning. And when, I'm, when I teach, I often say, uh, in reflection of this kind of a question, that in any piece of art, particularly as it moves through the years and then is surrounded by evolving context, that there's always going to be, I, I try to visualize this, there's always going to be different arrows that the work sends out. And that for any set of eyes, they might grab a hold of one arrow over another, right? It's your job for that one arrow that's most important to you to never be lost. And a good work of art, regardless of time and place, always does that one thing, transcends context and always does that one thing. Now that thing can be very simple. It can be something as simple as, how do I, I don't know, how do I see violence? It doesn't necessarily have to be about a particular victim. It doesn't have to be about a particular time uh, or, or an event. But the ways in which, and I'm using my own work as an example, the ways in which the viewer is implicated in that work has to be there. Otherwise, I'm not doing my job. No? Thanks for that question. <laughs> Hi, thanks so much for this presentation. Um, I think I'm really curious about how from, I'm a dancer, and so I'm really curious about this sort of journey you've gone on from a background in training in visual arts to such a deeply embodied practice. And if you could talk a bit more about like how you develop these embodied practices and principles that like really inform your work now. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, so the performance work, before I get into, into specifically the embodied work, so much of how I began to understand my performance practice, and I may have said to, to you all in this class earlier, is that the very subject that I was conveying in my two-dimensional work is something that I also held inside of me and that I, that I could enact through my body because of my athletic experience, that there is a sort of spatial and physical awareness that was already built into me because of my experience on the football field. And so when it came time to orchestrating a movement and being attuned to the choreography of my body, and I don't mean scripted choreography, but the way it moved through space, it felt the same like drawing on a piece of paper. I knew where my body could be and where it could land in order to translate a thing. It didn't feel so foreign to me, interestingly. And now, as I became more and more interested in, to, in this methodology of embodiment, you know, I became a student. And I, I consider myself as much as a student, as a practitioner. And these days, and for the last few years, what I'm most um, compelled uh, to, to study and look into is actually behavioral sciences, most, specific, most specifically cognitive therapy, and the ways in which 
in that space, which is very different than psychotherapy, talk therapy. Uh, you know, you're, you're trying to assess behaviors that are linked to trauma. And I think one of the great possibilities of an art practice is to engage that, that same theory through movement and to understand that trauma is quite literally lodged in our body. And so to attend to that and possibly free oneself from it, movement, dance, can be the starting point. And it is a, I think it's an emerging field, but there are some really incredible people doing some stuff, you know? Did that answer your question? Yeah. Maybe one or two more. Yeah. Thank you so much for the, tonight's um, presentation. My question is, I'm pretty sure you used the word accountability mm -hmm. at one point. I'd love for you to talk about to what or to whom you are accountable as an artist and perhaps in some ways more broadly, the, the artist herself and some himself themselves to what sort of accountability? I need a lot of have? time for that. <laughs> I'll try. I'll do my best. Because uh, I and I and I, I do I do speak of that term or utilize that term quite often in my work, both in my art practice and in my institutional roles. Um, let me offer you this as a framework, which is sort of central to everything that I do. How? As a question, how would you consider accountability existing alongside care? And so, so much of my practice is understanding that there are certain bodies, individuals, human beings with lived experiences that have close proximity to the subject of my work. And as I call those individuals in to participate, I have an accountability to hold them to do the work well, but in order to produce that work well, they need to be cared for. As host, therefore, my priority must be their well-being and not outcome. And that dictates a very different process, a slower one, a messier one. Now, when it comes to audiences that then come to that work, my accountability to the subject and therefore the ways in which their lived experiences, and by subject, I mean the subject, not bodies as subject, but theme as subject, let's say, that the way that I am expressing that work outwardly and inviting audience members in, that the accountability must be in making sure every person in that room understands that they actually do have a proximity to that subject, even though they would prefer to deny it. And therefore, I'm pulling individuals in that would rather and say, like, no, these lived experiences that we're sharing are your problem. And that's the accountability that I try to build into the individuals and to my work. Now, in doing that, again, I have to be sure that people, human beings, don't become subject. And that they are not the material of my work that I'm offering up to an audience. So instead, I have to pull folks closer to their humanity, to a shared humanity. And in order to do that, there has to be an essence of care for everyone in this space. And now, it's hard to do that. As, and it's, I would say it's hard based on context, it's hard based on institution, and it's certainly hard when it's 
two-dimensional work that you send out into the world. And so I do what I can. I do what's within my power. But I often think there's more at our disposal than we, than we know. We do have more power in carving out the space for our work and the people that our, that our work touches. And I, I feel like um, to sort of abandon the people that this work is about um, You know, socially engaged practice relies, good socially engaged practice, relies on prioritizing relationship first. And I think I receive much more from that. It's a gift. And that's where I want to be. I learn just as much as I offer. Does that make sense? Should we do one more, man? One? Make it a good one, y'all. <laughs> Fantastic. I got so much I could ask you, but I think what I'm hearing in this last piece, the Four Freedoms piece, is that the, for maybe the first time in your career, the site really came to the foreground of your practice. So in, in the past, you've created these works. They've gone to places like amazing places like the Guggenheim, but the work has always occurred inside of the institution. That's right. And for the first time, you're going to a place, letting the story of the place really come to the fore of the work. Well said. And so my brain is on fire with all the possibilities that are ahead for you. Mm. But... I'm curious, you know, now that, that, that there's this new framework for the way that your work exists out in the world, if going back to the monument question, if there was any place you could go, where would you go and what would you do? Oh, my God, wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, let me affirm the, your earlier statement. It was an incredibly exciting challenge and opportunity and therefore utilizing the term intervention to think about how I arrive at this context and what do I do with it. Um, and it opens up all sorts of possibilities. And I would say in the past, of course, sight has influenced the, uh, the material shaping of the work, but it's always been the vessel that the work like falls within. Whereas now, the, as you said, the site becomes the starting point and therefore the canvas. And it's a very different relationship with place, and I have to keep you know, examining that and thinking about that. But, I mean, I've not thought about this. Um, so I'm going to do some free thinking. You, <laughs> I, um, OK, uh, this is like arbitrary, but it's probably like, you know, if I had to reason it, it would, it would, you know, it would make sense. I don't know. I would love the Capitol building. That would, you know, I think, like, how, let's go big. <laughs> In terms of intervention, let's go there. I would also, I often think about um, the grandness of stadiums. And I would love to create an intervention in, in like, Dallas Cowboys Stadium. Um, that's what's occurring to me. You know, and then I often, I also think about just like really quiet, overlooked uh, spaces like the corner that I, that I used to drink 40s on. I would like to revisit that and create something out of that, that texture, that energy. And then finally, 322, Bowdoin. Maybe I'd like to fuck with that polar bear statue out there. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs>